I am broken and hopeless. And I reject the idea that God defines me and loves me. I do not find my worth in those words. People tell me that I am special, but they're wrong. It's a lie. I am broken forever and will never be free. They say that Jesus loves me and cares about me. But this cannot be true because I am worthless. For so long I believed in the distorted idea that there is a hope and a future for me. Now I look around and it is evident. Jesus is not enough. For so long I thought true love could be found. But now I realize that no one will ever love me. I used to believe that my life had divine purpose. I soon realized life is empty and meaningless. No one can heal the pain, the broken heart, and the shattered dreams I've endured. God and his love fails. His love for me never existed. The healing, purpose, and freedom in my life I always sought was so far off. I've come to the conclusion that life is meaningless and has no purpose. I refuse to believe that Jesus loves me. That is what I believed, until mercy taught me how to flip the script. Jesus loves me. I refuse to believe that life is meaningless and has no purpose. I've come to the conclusion that was so far off. The healing, purpose and freedom in my life I always sought existed. His love for me never fails. God and His love can heal the pain, the broken heart and the shattered dreams I have endured. No one life is empty and meaningless. I soon realized my life has divine purpose. I used to believe that no one will ever love me, but now I've realized that true love could be found. For so long, I thought Jesus is not enough. Now I look around and it is evident there is a hope and a future for me. For so long, I believed in the distorted idea that I am worthless. This cannot be true because Jesus loves me and cares about me. They say that I am broken forever and will never be free. They are wrong, it's a lie. People tell me that I am special, but I do not find my worth in those words. God defines me and loves me. And I reject the idea that I am broken and hopeless. I love that. Isn't that true about Jesus' love, how he flips the script? Aren't you thankful that his love isn't based on merit, our merit, but rather his love is based on his mercy? See, when we talk about flipping the script, we're talking about turning the tide, blazing a new trail, going against a pre-established or a preconceived norm. And when it comes to love, Jesus completely flips the script on that. Where the world would say that love is about uh, sensual feelings or demands some type of return or is conditional or that you have to perform. Jesus says that love is fearless. And he loves us regardless of our background, our past experience, our ethnicity. And he longs for us to love others in the same way. His love is sacrificial. In fact, he loved us to such a degree that he died for us because he recognized that in his creation that we are intrinsically valuable. See, as we begin today, Passion Week, it's a reminder of what the cross and his death is about. It's about that love that's not based on our merit because there's nothing that we could offer to him that would be worth what a holy Glorious God deserves. But rather by his mercy, he looks at us, sends his son in, in pursuit of us. And by the death of Jesus, we are now justified for those who call him Lord. Man, that's great news for us. Because not only did his death pay for the penalty of sin. 
He didn't stop there. See, the payment of our sin would just have made us morally neutral, but rather he gave us his righteousness. And it's in his righteousness that now we can have a relationship with the one true God. That's good news. Well, I want to, uh, we're going to spend our time this morning in John chapter 13. Man, it is a great passage. But I, I want to back up to John 12. And John 13 is the beginning. It, it, it happens on a Thursday night. And it's the beginning of Jesus preparing the Passover meal with his disciples. And then it's 24 hours away from him going to the cross. But I want to take you back to a story that happens right before John 13 and John 12 and Matthew 26. And it's a story about Mary and Judas. And this is important that I tell you this story because it really sets up all of John 13. And it's important that when we are reading Scripture, that we're reading chunks of Scripture, that we are looking at the context of Scripture. And speaking of context, this, this particular passage in John 12 or Matthew 26, which, whichever one you were to look at, it was meant to be read together. It looks like two stories. It looks like a story about Mary, who's anointing Jesus, and it looks like a story about Judas, who is betraying Jesus. But when we look at the Greek syntax and we look at the sentence structure, what we find is that story was intended to be told together. Because there's a juxtaposition, there's a contrast that Scripture wants to place before us that raises a question that we must answer. And there's no better time to answer that than during the Passion Week. You may remember the story. Mary, this is not the mother of Jesus, this is Mary Martha Jesus. And Mary has this expensive bottle of perfume. And she comes to Jesus and, and they're hanging, he's hanging out with his disciples. And she begins to pour this expensive bottle of perfume over Jesus. Now, they say this is about a pound of perfume. That's a lot of perfume. It's about a year's wages of salary. It's expensive. And Judas, not good Judas, Judas Iscariot, bad Judas, looks at Jesus and he says, that is such a waste, Jesus. We could have sold that bottle of perfume and we could have fed the poor with that. And Jesus says, listen, you're going to have the poor with you always, but I will not always be here with you. And the other disciples, when we look at like Matthew 26's account of that, they're just befuddled. They can't believe that Mary would expend so much perfume. And it's important for you to understand the value of this perfume because um, there's more than meets the eye to this perfume. Perfume and jewelry, particularly gold jewelry, back then, back then and, and this is still true today in many parts of the Middle East, expresses the woman's net worth. It expresses kind of her future holdings. And women would keep this, and this is sad uh, uh, that this is true, but they would keep these, these uh, uh, gold jewelry pieces and this perfume, and it was essentially like collateral for them, so that when, when nobody else is there to take care of them, they would be able to trade this in for money. So this is pretty significant what she's doing here. Because she's essentially saying, I'm going to give you my most precious possession, Jesus. I'm going to give you all that I have, I'm, I'm going to stake my future on your holdings, not mine. I'm no longer going to fear the future. Rather, I'm going to allow your perfect love to replace that. Now, in the same story, Judas immediately, after he said that's a waste, that's crazy, he walks out and he goes to Caiaphas' house. Now, Caiaphas was the high priest, and this was no house. This was a mansion. Caiaphas was taking money from the Jews and everybody else. And Caiaphas had been looking for some way to corner Jesus and for somebody to take a Roman guard or, or a Jewish guard 
to find Jesus and bring him to trial. And he says, hey, I'll give you 30 shekels if you'll do that for me, Judas. Judas says, that sounds like a good deal. Now, you need to know that 30 shekels is less than three months worth of wages. And here we have Judas who essentially sells his soul for 30 shekels when he could have given up all that he had and inherited all that Jesus gives, but rather he gave up for the immediate, the ultimate. And yet Mary, on the other hand, chose to fearlessly put her future in Jesus and sacrificially love him even though it came at a great worldly cost to her. I mean, that's flipping the script. See, there will come a point, and for many of you there has already come a point, where you have to determine whether you are going to express self-love or self-surrender. Are you going to go after the immediate and what the world says, hey, you can have all this for the time being? Or will you surrender what you have and inherit what only Jesus can give? Let me just keep that story in mind as we continue to talk through this. But I I want to just stop and pray for us for a second. Father, would you help put in us a fearless and sacrificial love like Jesus had for us? And Father... Will you help us express that fearless and sacrificial love back to Jesus and back to one another? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me take you back about 2,000 years ago to a Sunday right around 33 A.D. And and, um, the crowds were beginning to just come over Jerusalem. And they had heard about this itinerant rabbi who had been doing miracles. And they're now thinking the Messiah is coming. And so Jerusalem was just shaking. I mean, they were excited. I mean, there was just a buzz there. The Roman government was also kind of buzzing because, you know, there was only one person to be worshipped, and that was Caesar. And now Jerusalem is just about to get flipped. Now, the Passover celebration was a response to what God had done for the Egyptians. You may remember this thousands of, I mean, if you remember this in thousands of years ago, uh, that would be amazing. You may remember the story thousands of years ago and of the Passover when uh, God was going to execute judgment on the Egyptians. And he says, I want you Israelites, Hebrew people, to wipe the blood of, blood of lambs across your Uh, over your doorposts, and that will weigh the Spirit when he passes to execute that judgment on the Egyptians. He'll just pass by. He'll just pass over. Draken. And so they're celebrating this deliverance that they had thousands of years ago because of God's faithfulness and his goodness. Now, at this point, Jesus is on the Mount of Olives with his disciples. He hasn't come into the city just yet, but he's standing there on the Mount of Olives. He looks at a couple of his disciples and said, hey, I need you to go to a nearby village and get me a donkey, okay? I'm going to ride in to Jerusalem on a donkey. Now, I don't know if the disciples go, oh, Zechariah 9.9. They probably didn't, but we know that that was prophesied, that it said that, that Jesus, the new king would come riding in on the foal of a donkey. So Jesus gets on this donkey. He begins to go westward into the city. And as people see him coming, they take palm branches and they begin to, begin to just put these palm branches down like this royal red carpet being laid out for Jesus. Now this is significant because the very fact that Jesus is riding in on a donkey, he's making a definitive statement about who he is as king. And the people around him, I mean, they're just yelling, Hosanna, which means Savior, or it means the one who has come to help us right now. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Romans are not happy about this. 
The Pharisees are especially not happy about this. In fact, the Pharisees start yelling at Jesus, Hey, you, you, need to be, you, need, you, you shouldn't let them acclaim you as king. They're yelling at Jesus saying, You better stop letting them praise you and glorify you. Which is kind of a silly deal because, I mean, Jesus is the king of kings. I mean, it only makes sense that people would worship him, praise him, acclaim him. I mean, why would the creator of the universe, the king of kings, do anything other than be praised? Now, up to this moment, though, for the most part, Jesus' ministry had been pretty peaceful. And had he not ridden in on a donkey, it probably could have stayed that way. For a bit, but he was drawing a line in the sand. He had set in motion a series of events that would either lead to the overthrow of the, the, the Jewish elite and the Roman government or his death. <coughs> Excuse me. But crossing into Jerusalem on that donkey crossed a line of no return. There could be no rival king to Caesar. And yet you and I both know that there can be no rival king to Jesus either. Isn't that what Paul reminded us? That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow on heaven and on earth and even under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that he is Christ Jesus the Lord. So there, so three days pass. So we've moved from Sunday to Wednesday. And at this point on Wednesday, uh, Jesus had been teaching in the temples and synagogues. He'd been speaking about his impending death. The Pharisees and Sadducees, they had called the Sanhedrin, which is just a fancy name for all the Sadducees and Pharisees to get together and, and, and uh, hang out and eat hummus. <laughs> and, uh, which hummus in Jerusalem is delicious, by the way. But nonetheless, they're deciding on a plot to kill Jesus. Even Caiaphas begins to get into the mix, knowing that Jesus couldn't stick around. Yet, they also knew that they couldn't kill Jesus during the Passover because that would just create an eruption. But it was clear at this point, on this Wednesday, that not only could there be no rival to Caesar, there could be no rival to the Jewish elite. Well, Thursday rolls around. We're 24 hours out from Jesus' death. He looks at Peter and John, says, hey, I need you to go find me a large room in the city of Jerusalem. Now, it was Old Testament law that uh, to celebrate the Passover meal at this point, you had to do it within the city limits of Jerusalem. Now, this was going to be a little bit difficult for them because Jesus was not only a celebrity, he was also a rebel. And so they were having to kind of find some space in secrecy. But they were preparing for roasted lamb and bitter herbs and some fruit sauce and some other things they would eat during that Passover meal. And this is where we pick up in John chapter 13. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to John 13, verse 1. Now again, this is... Jesus is preparing for the Passover meal. This is where he is about to institute the Lord's Supper for the first time. But there's some incredible things here that we see. Chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. Oh, by the way, I don't want you to miss the fact that he knew that Judas was going to betray him. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash your feet, you have no share with me. 
Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you were right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. What an incredible picture of humiliation and humbleness. He derobes, he would have had probably a thobe on, which is like a giant t-shirt that goes down to his ankle. And he derobes and he grabs a a servant or slave towel and he puts it around his waist. And And the grimiest part of the body, remember they didn't have plumbing, indoor plumbing back then. It just kind of flowed through the streets and they didn't have many closed toe shoes either. And he sits at his disciples' feet and he begins to wash them. I mean, what an incredible... Knowing that one set of feet that he is washing will be a set of feet that has already gone to Caiaphas' mansion and made a deal with the devil. And yet he washes his feet. And then he looks at his disciples after he has done this in verse 14. and says, so if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done for you. Listen, he is setting up what will ultimately speak to every disciple of Jesus upon his return. That we would serve fearlessly and sacrificially. (laughs) I mean, this probably blew their mind because Israel and and even his followers were thinking and hoping that not only would Jesus come and rule, but he would replace Caesar. He would eliminate the, the Roman government. He would take away the trite traditions of Judaism at this point. But he didn't come with pomp and circumstance. He came with humility and meekness, flipping the script. He's choosing to teach his disciples what this expression of his kingdom rule looks like so that they could continue to glorify him even in his death. Look at verse 21. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of the disciples whom Jesus loved was reclining at at table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. Can you get that picture? Jesus, it's not me, is it? (laughs) You're not talking about me. It's probably that guy over there, right? Peter was kind of like that, I think. Jesus answered, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. And Jesus said to him, what what you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, which he always did, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast. Or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out. And it was night. I mean, can you imagine what that would feel like to be Jesus? I mean, he he had spent over three years with Judas. They had traveled all over the place. 
They, they had, uh, had jokes around the campfire at night. Yeah, Jesus was funny, I guarantee you that. They had gotten out of trouble together. They had, they had been in some of the most dire situa- situations. Judas had seen Jesus perform miracles and healings. He was one of his closest friends. He was one of the twelve. And he betrays Jesus. Can you imagine? Some of you have experienced and felt and sensed betrayal before. You've experienced the pain of that. And by by golly, you would not wash a person's feet. You know, sometimes betrayal... Even if it just happens once to us, we end up projecting that upon all of our other relationships. Yet, that's not what Jesus did. In fact, he goes on to talk about the defining characteristic of his ministry. Again, there are 24 hours until his crucifixion. I want you to look with me at verse 31 now. And this is the beginning of what they call the upper room discourse. Time is short. Every word, every action matters. Jesus has a clear understanding of his suffering and the difficulty that lies ahead. He has already washed the feet of his disciples. He's reminded them of the need for loving, self-sacrificial service to one another. Now he is going to highlight what is to be the defining characteristic of his ministry and of the ministry of his people. Look at verse 31. When he had gone out, talking about Judas, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Listen, the, the word glorify is used 23 times in the book of John. It is used five times in these two verses. He's making a point. In fact, we had a great sermon last week that TJ preached, talked about how sometimes our shipwrecks are ex- expressions of God's glory when we walk through them well. Here is Jesus saying, I am going to be glorified in my suffering. You can be assured of that, that my suffering will do something. It will flip the script that no other sacrifice has ever been able to do. Look at verse 33. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I'm going to you, you cannot come. Verse 34. A new commandment. In fact, that word new can also mean singular. A new, a singular commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. In fact, there's an imperative there. Some of your translations say must love one another. You also ought to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, you need to understand that when Jesus came on the scene to earth, there were 630 Old Testament laws. That's a lot of laws. You could barely walk without breaking the law as a Hebrew, literally. And shortly into his ministry, he says, we're going to just narrow this down to two laws, right? Two greatest commandments, love God, love people. Now he's saying there is one law. There is one commandment. Love one another just as I have loved you. And by your love for one another, this will be the defining distinction who my people will be. Listen, if a big brown truck rolls up to your house and there's yellow riding on the side of it, and then a guy in brown, a brown outfit with you know, brown short sleeve shirt and shorts gets out of there, we know that is... Yeah, it's easy to identify that organization. Now, see, most of us think that the church is to be identified by steeples and stained glass and and wooden crosses and cross tattoos and WWJD bracelets and fish on the back of our car. And you need to understand that what Jesus is talking about is the defining characteristic of a disciple is none of those things. He could care less about those things. 
What he wants is fearless and sacrificial love that is exuding out of his people at whatever cost that it takes. And and here's what we know. Is that after Jesus makes this defining statement in his ministry, he goes to the cross. And he dies on behalf of us, willingly. Listen, Jesus didn't didn't die because he unintentionally ticked off the Jewish police and the Roman government. He willfully went to the cross on the behalf of you and me. So, and he knew, he knew that it was only by his perfect love and a perfect sacrifice that we, as a broken, bitter, busted, and sometimes disgusted people, could be saved. I like what T.D. Jake says. Sorry, it just reminded me, this is not in my notes. Very little of this is in my notes today anyway, so I might as well just keep going. He says, you may be broke down, busted, and disgusted, but you can still praise the Lord, right? Because he is risen. <laughs> Y'all are slipping a little bit. Y'all are slipping. <laughs> I want you to think back real quick to that story of Mary and Ju- Judas for a second. I mean, here's where the question comes before us again. Are we going to participate in self-love like Judas did? Are we going to participate in self-surrender like Mary? Are we willing to put our future holdings in the one who holds the world? Are we willing to put our, our trust and our love in the one who died for us? See, here's the point this morning. By the way, you know what Mary found out? is that really the greatest way for her to love herself is by surrendering herself. Oh, that we would figure that out. Oh, that I would figure that out. But here's the point this morning that Jesus is trying to get across, is that his strategy for reaching the world was through fearless and sacrificial love. This was his primary method. It wasn't handing out tracts and mail outs and revival meetings. He's talking about fearless and sacrificial love. And he wants his disciples to operate in the same way. This in fearless love recognizes that our ability to love people is not based on our capacity to love people. Because you and I both know that that just won't happen in our bitterness and hurt and our pain. But rather that it is found in Christ's sufficiency to love us And then for us to love people through his sufficiency. See, we often love poorly because we fear greatly. That's why I love this picture of fearless love that we see this morning. You know, we we often fear because we're we're worried about rejection. We fear because our expectations won't be met. We fear because of past hurts. We fear because of just ignorance. Maybe we don't know something about somebody and that creates a fear or insecurity in us. We fear because of prejudice. Listen, our world is, is you know, predicated on fear in so many ways. I mean, it is the fabric of marketing that they try to produce fear in us in order to create a followership to them. And over and over, we see Jesus looking at his disciples saying, fear not. You got nothing to fear. Listen, the church has no business in engaging in fear. We are to operate fearlessly. Because that perfect love, that fearless and sacrificial love that Jesus demonstrated on the cross for you and me, When we live in that perfect love, it drives out fear. You know what 1 John 4, 18 says? There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out or drives out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Sacrificial love means you give up your rights and your preconditions to love another regardless of the cost. That's hard for us. 
But I go back, I start thinking back to what, I mean, Jesus is washing the feet of Judas. Even though, even though I've been betrayed, I'm not talking about immediate trust, but we're to sacrificially love, even when we've been betrayed. Even though they're different from me, even though I don't agree with their lifestyle, I will love them just as Jesus has loved me. And here's what you find when you fearlessly and sacrificially love, is that even those who've hurt us, when we're loving them well, it will bring us to a place of freedom, regardless of their response. There's one standard for love, and it's been set by Jesus. It's been set right here in John chapter 13. When Jesus talks about love, he's talking about fearless and sacrificial love. This is not some Hallmark movie or some Oprah interest story. This is fearless, bold, surrendered type of love. What Paul says that, but God showed his great love for us. And while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. One of the stories of fearless and sacrificial love that I just value is the story of Jim and Elizabeth Elliot and Nate Saint. Man, I've, I've read it a thousand times and I still get choked up thinking about this type of love. There are five, five families uh, that decided they would go to Ecuador to a tribe called the Quechua. And while they were ministering to the Quechua tribe, they decided, or they heard about this other tribe called the Aka. Now, the Aka were kind of this Stone Age uh, tribe. They, they would kill people. Any, I mean, you'd look at them funny or crossways. Everybody was afraid of them. The government was afraid of them. Shell was trying to bring in workers to excavate oil there, and they kept getting killed off. So their land was just off limits. But the Elliots and the Saints and, and the other three families, they recognized that if they didn't go into this place, that they wouldn't know Jesus. Now, Jim and Elizabeth had been married just for a couple years. They had a 10-month-old baby. Nate Saint and his wife, they'd been married a little bit longer. He was in his 30s at this point, and they had a 4-year-old son named Steve. But they recognized that they had to go to this place. In fact, they started praying and flying over the Aka tribe. And every time they would fly over the Aka, they would drop peanut butter sandwiches, because we know those are awesome, and mosquito repellent. And if you've ever been in the jungle, peanut butter sandwiches and mosquito repellent, man, that's life. They were hoping to drop some good seeds so that when they flew in there with peanut butter sandwiches and mosquito repellent, that they would be celebrities. Well, they did this over and over, and then five men came that day. It was, it was a, a day early January, January 5th, 1956. They fly in, peanut butter sandwiches, mosquito repellent. They have a transistor radio with them so that they could make calls back and forth to the Ketcha camp where their spouses were at. Four days in, the call that was to be routine back to their spouses hadn't come. And their spouses get really concerned. So they call the Air Force. The Air Force flies over the Aka tribe, the land, and they see the five men with their heads down floating in the river. Not even four days in. <laughs> I love what Jim Elliott said. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. You see, some of us I know hear that story and we go, you know, he had a, Jim Elliott had a 10 month old baby. And Nate Saint had a four-year-old son. And we, we think to ourselves how irresponsible that was for them. And yet you need to understand that the price of loving fearlessly and sacrificially sometimes means that we give up those things. 
You know, and I would just raise this for a second. <laughs> I mean, if we really want to talk about irresponsibility, let's talk about God sending Jesus to an earth where his children kept denying him over and over and over, settling for the immediate when they could have the ultimate. And yet Jesus still went to the cross on our behalf. It's not about responsibility or irresponsibility. It's about love. It's about a sacrificial, fearless love. Now, good news is that's not the end of the story. You know, what seems like a tragic end is often a start to a miraculous beginning. Those spouses stayed with the Ketcha family, and they were deeply hurt, as you can imagine. There was two Aka women who had escaped their tribe and were living there with the spouses. And they began to learn the language of the Aka, particularly Nate Saint's sister, Rachel, and Jim Elliott's wife, Elizabeth. In fact, if you want to read more about this, she wrote a book called Through the Gates of Splendor. It's an amazing book. And they began to learn the language of the Aka women. They began to learn the culture. They began to love this tribe from afar. But as they were loving this people, they knew that they had to go too. few months later, Elizabeth Elliot and Rachel Saint walked into that Akka village. <laughs> and there were women waiting on them saying, we heard that the spouses of the men we killed have come. We want to know about the man maker. <laughs> well, before you know it, The Aka women and now the Aka men were making decisions to follow Christ. They were starting to translate the Bible into their tribal language. In fact, Rachel Saint ended up living there the rest of her life until she died. In fact, her nephew, Steve, you remember the four-year-old boy? He eventually uprooted his family in Oklahoma and they moved to the Aka tribe. And they lived there for most of their life. The chief of that particular tribe, his name is Minkai. Minkai was the one who put the spear into his father's side. And Steve Saint and Minkai are best friends today. In fact, their relationship was so tight that Steve's children call Minkai grandfather. <laughs> I think back to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15. He says, for the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all Therefore, all have died, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So who do you need to love fearlessly and sacrificially? What does that look like in your jungle? Is that a neighbor? Is that a family member? Is that somebody that you've just been at odds with? See, some of us are asking the question, well, what is God calling me to do? And the question is not about what this morning. The question is about who. You know, for some of us, you need to begin to fearlessly and sacrificially love the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That you've been kind of on the sideline. Maybe you've been wearing the jersey, but you just, you know, you're benched. And that's your own doing. And you need to just come surrendered before the King this morning. 
It may be that you know exactly. Listen, I, I have no doubt. I believe that there's some people that I don't even know about in this room that are supposed to go to the unreached people in this world. And that this morning, this is just further confirmation. It's not like this was the first time you heard a word from the Lord about this, but you have known about this for a while, and you just needed somebody, you needed Scripture to go, by the way, this is who you're to go to. For some of you, you're going, that better not be me. <laughs> but for some of you, the most fearful thing is just making it right with your son or daughter or your mom or dad or your coworker or your neighbor or your classmate. So what jungle do you need to go to this morning? Father, thank you for your fearless and sacrificial love that compels us, that can, controls us, that, that speaks into us, that saves us. Well, Father, would you help us express that back to you and to one another? That we would truly love one another as you have loved us. And that our love for you and our love for others would be the distinctive mark of our life. In Jesus' name, amen.